It's time now for On the Radar when we ask an investing professional what they're looking at in today's markets. We're back once again with Rob Tetro of Tetro Wealth Advisory Group to discuss how the U.S. Fed may have to start cutting rates before reaching their 2% target. Thank you so much for joining us again, Rob. Let's start right there. Tell us wh why do you think that the Fed is going to have to move faster than expected? Yes, and by the way, I had to brave a Manitoba uh, April storm to be here this morning because the roads are closed, the schools are closed. It's a, it, We get storms here in the middle of April in Winnipeg. But yes, I think the U.S. Fed has talked forever about this 2% target, but I think we now know, you know, they, they've set up their plots, they've said, oh, you know, once once inflation hits 2%, we can start, we can start looking at uh, you know, the reverse of tightening. So looking at some easing of some sort, whether it be it through interest rates or through asset purchases, but it's just not feasible in my mind. And I think it's been spoken about before and some experts have said it, and I, I will uh, I'll contend that I have the same opinion. I think as soon as you kind of start to see something in the three and a half range, maybe even 4%, they're going to start talking about easing again, because, you know, you, you talk about your delinquencies, your debt increasing, you've got, um, you don't want to have companies like bond uh, bond delinquencies and bond yields and, and credit spreads increasing. So that becomes problematic if you can't have it both ways. I recognize that, but you can't also just kind of bankrupt the country just to make sure that your inflation is under control. You know, we have already seen yields move just overnight in the U.S. because it's clear that there is no consensus view between, you know, the, the Fed, the Fed chair and the various members of it. They've been speaking outright about how they see the terminal rate at a different point than what, you know, the, the lead does. And so that has led to concerns in the marketplace. And as a result, the short term yield treasuries are higher. So what do you think about that divergence in opinion and what that does in terms of investor sentiment at a time when recessionary fears, stagflation concerns as well, very much pronounced. Yeah, the, the fears are real. And I think if you look at the market expectations versus the FOMC year end estimates or, or their expectations, their plot charts, if you will, uh, they are not in sync. There's a dramatic reduction in expectation. There's a quicker reduction in uh, long term or interest rates or the FOMC decisions uh, by the market than there is by the actual FOMC. So you have this, this oh, this longer kind of diminishing yield uh, interest rate, or I should say uh, interest rate curve for the FOMC, which is like 5.10, 4.3 by the end of 2023 and uh, 3.10 by the end of 2025, whereby the market's expecting about 80 basis points less than that throughout. So typically on this, the market is usually right. My dad used to always say the bond market's never wrong. And I think we're seeing that now and you mentioned it uh, in your question as well we're seeing it in the market so the market is certainly expecting quicker turnaround kind of similar to what i am in your notes you speak about how cash very much is a favorite given the sort of wider uncertainty about what the next move could be but for those investors who are willing to take on a bit more risk where would you advise them to be seeking those returns Okay, so I'm not a believer that you should be timing the market. You shouldn't be going all in or all out or, or with a significant portion of your assets. I'm a believer that you should have an asset allocation that matches your liquidity needs and your long-term needs. So we're, you know, I've, I've never been kind of an aggressive uh, all in, all out. However, that being said, if you have cash, you need to put that money to work the next time the market kind of dips somewhat because we know that the, the burn on cash is significant. Cash is now the most favorite asset right now in the market. And the least favorite asset is U.S. equities. So think about that for a sec, how contrarian that is. And historically, that's been a very strong buy signal. So everyone prefers cash. People hate equities. Usually the time to get in. And when the reverse is happening, that's usually the time to get out. So I'm not I'm not saying that this is the absolute unequivocally best time to get in. I'm saying you should always own equities based, you, you know, you should always own, if your asset allocation should be 60% equities or 50% equities, you should always have that amount. If you need to have 30% alts, you should always have 30% alts. And the timing of the market is something you should try to avoid. I know I probably sound like a boomer or I probably sound like your grandpa, uh, but that's what I believe in. And that's my core belief with respect to asset allocation and portfolio theory. So if you want to transcend some of that wider market 
chaos, what are those wide moat stocks that you're looking at or sectors that you would want to sort of be in to shield yourself from what could be, you know, turbulence, at least in the near term? Okay, so if you're sitting on 10, 20, 30% cash in your portfolio, you want to put it back to work, you're not going to like my answer, but it's boring <laughs> as heck. But I would put a sliver into the 15 or 20 Canadian stocks that you own and a sliver into the 15 or 20 US stocks that you own, the ones that are slightly underweight, you would top them up. This is like prudent portfolio management. I know nobody that watches your show does this, but that's how we manage money. So if, you know, if your Facebook was lower exposure and you own that, you know, six months ago, you would have been topping that up, you would have been buying it at a lower price. Price. And conversely, if you know, in any of your, your commodities, your oil and gas stocks that you own, your one or two or maybe three oil and gas stocks that you own, you would have been maybe uh, trimming those, you know, a few months back, and maybe you're adding a little bit to them now. So I would be adding across all your sectors, across all of the portfolio, specifically to the asset allocation inside the accounts that have the smaller relative weight today. That's a boring answer, but sorry. <laughs> well, actually, speaking of oil assets right now, do you have any favorites given, you know, prices slightly dipping the overall view, whether you're speaking to our, or listening to an OPEC plus official talking about those triple digit gains? Do you even see those in sight given the macro concerns that continue to abound? So I am bullish on oil and gas stocks. And I've said this before on, on, on this show, and I, I believe that we're in for kind of a uh, a, a longer cycle, uh, higher for longer cycle for oil in the future, whether it's one, three, or even five years. Uh, so I think you should own some names. And if you don't have some names, you should own some. I have to be a little bit careful here with compliance as to what names I say, but make sure you own some of the mid caps and some of the large caps. And if you're not sure what to own, buy a little bit of each because you want it like that mid cap space. And even if you're, if you have a higher risk tolerance, there's a few names in the small cap space. So you, you need to own some of this. In my opinion, you cannot stay away from it unless you're morally opposed to the sector as a whole, because it will outperform over the next three to five years. I, I strongly believe that. And if we look at those banking contagion woes over in the U.S. and what that does for the Canadian marketplace, I mean, we've been here before. This is not the first crisis, if you will, in terms of confidence for financials overall. But in fact, historically, the Canadian marketplace bodes well when there is a full on assault when it comes to the U.S. marketplace or globally. So with that in mind, what do you think of TSX financials right now moving forward for investors who are looking to take on a little bit more risk? Yeah, I would see that as, you know, if you own equities, if you're comfortable owning equities, you probably have owned Canadian banks. And I'm sure a lot of the viewers of the show here own a lot of Canadian banks. I think of, uh, I think of my dad again, who's always, always owned Canadian banks. Well, there, I don't think the story's changed. So you should continue to own them. And on weakness, you could definitely add to those positions. They're going to be safe. They're, they're generating any you know, 10 plus percent shareholder return on equity year in, year out. The dividend yields on some of those have increased significantly. If you're looking for that income, extremely tax efficient. Some of those yields are higher than they have historically been. I see no, uh, pro I see no reason to avoid Canadian banks. And if you're underweight, obviously consider adding them in. Just to clarify a comment, that you made earlier. I definitely see reasons to be bullish in the kind of midterm. I do know that I don't know what will happen short term. So I don't right. know if we're going to get a 5 or 10% correction or a pullback here, which would be potentially, some would say, healthy for this market. It might happen. But the thing is, it doesn't really... It doesn't really matter if we get that five or ten percent immediate pullback. And anyone who says that they know what's happening, they're BSing you because you don't know what's happening short term. So that's why I always look a little longer, you know, a year, three years, five years out, because there we can have a little bit of a better sense as to what's really happening when you look at multiples, etc. So yes, I'm bullish. You said Rob's bullish on equities. I certainly am. I, you know, we're always going to own equities. Always, I'm always going to own equities. And you know, short term there might be some volatility. You know, expect that the VIX is at a you know 19 or whatever. So expect that. But I do remain bullish. I remember on the back of the last BOC decision, there were concerns in the marketplace about a divergence between a BOC that was pausing and a Fed that was still hiking. Now we have seen a little, more, a little bit more alignment in terms of strategies. What do you think that's going to mean for Canadian investors who want to invest in Canadian assets? 
Well, I think a lot of Canadian investors are likely overweight Canadian assets. Historically, what I've seen, I see a lot of statements from Canadian retail investors. They send me their statements. Rob, what do you think of my portfolio? Happens all the time. They go to www.speaktorob.com and they just book a consultation. That's what happens. I think that we're overweight Canadian exposure for most Canadians. So you don't really want to be, I mean, depending on what you think of currency, you, ideally at some point you want to start trimming and having more exposure to global and U.S. assets. And I think most Canadians are way overweight Canadians. So I don't think they should be, I mean, if they're fearful, they, they could consider adding what they know in their backyard. But I think most Canadians need more U.S. and more global exposure, not less.